Dear, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear students, thank you very much for being with us. First of all, I would like to thank, I would like to thank Professor Jamal Din Alhani, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Arts of the University of Mohammed Sank, for his very warm welcome. As uh, Professor Alhani already said. Uh, in a smaller gathering that we had earlier. Uh, we have a very, very long uh, history of cooperation. According to a reliable source, uh, Salaf al Saleh, uh, Professor Qaduri, it goes back to 1985. I would say it goes back to, it goes back exactly 400 years to 1622, when Cholius and Al Hajri. They met here in Morocco. Uh, Al Hajari had already been to the Netherlands a few years earlier, but then the first Dutch researcher came to Morocco on a mission in 1622. So we could say that this mission is also celebrating 400 years uh, of academic and cultural exchange. And I'm very, very grateful to our dear friends and colleagues of the University Mohammed V in Rabat, uh, to which I was affiliated a long time ago as a PhD student, um, that they are welcoming us. And I'm also very grateful to our dear colleagues of the Leiden University Center for Arts in Society uh, that they were willing to come to Morocco and willing to look for uh, new projects for cooperation. So we look forward to having you visiting us in Leiden. We cannot promise you that the sweets and the refreshments will be as lavish and delicious as they are here. And there, this is a matter of heritage, so to speak. It's a, it's a very material her heritage that matters, but thank you very much for your welcome. So we have now on the program four short presentations which are related to dominant strands of research at the uh, Leiden U University Center for Arts and Society, uh, directed by Professor uh, Sibyl Lamas, who is a professor of new media and digital culture. And uh, she will take the floor first, and then I will announce the other speakers, since I do not yet know what is the proper order. So it's first, yeah, then, so second, well, then I can do it now will be for, uh, Professor Franz Willem Korsten, Kors who has a chair for the study of literature in society or and so society. literature and society. So um, that is another very important part of the uh, of Lucas, uh, the study of literature. And I'm sure there are many students and colleagues here in the room who work on literature as well. And then I think uh, Angus and Aris, uh, they will present together, I suppose? Or? Okay. Angus Moll will present, but he works together with Aris uh, Politopoulos. Uh, they are both archaeologists by training, but they work together with Professor Lamas in the field of what we call digital humanities, les sciences humaines numérisées. So uh, this is for us a relatively new field, but we hope that you will have an interest in that as well. And I, I hope it will be a kind of happy end because uh, Angus and Aris will speak about play, the element of play in culture, which is, I think, uh, one way to get closer to each other. And that is, uh, I think, the idea of today's meeting. So once again, thank you very much for your welcome. And marhaba uh, bikum fi Leiden, inshallah. Shukran. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us. We're very honored to be here. And um, we're going to present something of our work. Um, it's, not, it's more a taste that we, than we can present everything. Um, and one of the things we do at Lucas is engaging with play and games. And we do that in different ways. And as, as a researcher, you never do things on your own. You always do things in a team. I thought it would be appropriate not to just say 
what I'm doing, but what we are doing, hence that we are doing this presentation with the four of us. I will start with a short um, lecture about a couple of things which have been, to, we are, we are, have been very interesting for me uh, since five years, I would say, I've been working on the subject of, I always have worked on the pro, uh, subject of play, but since five years I'm very much interested in a relation between play, crisis and boredom. And why is that? First to start um, with one quite obvious statement, which is very much rooted or anchored in Leiden as well, and that is about the importance of play. Um, as uh, Professor Boskin said earlier on as well, on the one hand play is universal, but on the other hand it's also very local. We all play and not only children play. Here you see a picture of, I'm going to, you know, you, you think Arabic has guttural words, but the Dutch have them as well. This is uh, Johan Huizinga. Um, he's a famous scholar and he's still very well known for his work from 19... 38, I believe, on play, Homo Ludens, is a book he wrote and is translated in many, many different languages. Um, what he wrote, and that is a very powerful statement, as I just discussed with someone recently as well, uh, he already wrote in 1938 that play and culture arises and unfolds in and as play. So actually what he says is that humans, so not only children, need to play, to pr produce and to sustain culture. That's a very interesting thought, right? And some people may have thought about that before, but if you look at the world in, from this perspective, it's suddenly a slightly different world as well, I would say. So what's interesting for what I'm going to say here about crisis and boredom, and in relation to that about confinement as well, is that he also, Johan Huizinga and many play and game studies people after him as well, there's a strong correlation for Huizinga between play and freedom. And now, it seems so far away, but it has been not that long ago that we couldn't even travel to Morocco. We had to suspend uh, this travel twice because of that. Um, what happens then in times of crisis when maybe your freedom is less profound or wide and broad than in times of non-crisis, so to speak? And I'm referring, of course, to COVID-19 here, where we all experience that recently from very close by what that does with us. Um, what we saw, and probably you saw that in Morocco as well, but I would love to hear more about that, is actually during these moments of extreme crisis, you could say, uh, people didn't stop play, but actually they found play elsewhere. For example, we all remember the YouTube videos of people playing in their kitchens or making their whole house into a playground even, um, in their backyards, but also not to be... Uh, the, many people, for example, started to write books during uh, COVID-19, so play can also be subjective play, as Sutton Smith says, and it can also take place in our heads. Because you find that space somewhere else then when you maybe your other means of expressions have become more constrained. Also, um, this is um, related to something uh, which has been more and more important in the 20th century and also now in the, uh, after that, is the Declaration of the Rights of the Child of 1959, in which the UN said that actually playing is a right for children. So, and um, how that's also um, um, uh, defined in that UN document, it's also again about freedom and a fundamental right, a fundamental piece of who you are. So, um, that's an interesting sort of turn, I think, in how we think about play uh, 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 more um, consciously. So, for Housinga, Play is freedom and stopped when it's forced upon you. If I say to you, you have to play with me, 
it's not no fun anymore, right? You don't want to play with me anymore. It's that simple. So it's a very interesting cultural phenomenon in that sense as well. Now, and I think this is already sort of food for a sort of comparative study. When we look at Europe, especially, where we know far more about, of course, than the Moroccan context, um, after the 19th century, when also uh, surveillance society started to become stronger or more prevalent, and things became more ordered, also how, you, how children, for example, had to play, we all know these moments of curated play or curating play. Uh, in, uh, there's one uh, photograph here of Amsterdam Playground, which is very much a designed space. And there are many other examples in which it's very clear um, when you are supposed to play, also when you start up a video game, for example, but also when you enter a Japanese game parlor or whatever, I don't know the Japanese name for this uh, at this moment, but then it's also a very clear demarcation and it's also, you know, the architecture is in such a way that it sort of uh, has affordances which directs you to certain kinds of play. This is related, we would say, or I would say, but we have a lot of discussions about this concept of Heisinger, which has been uh, very uh, important, not only uh, for education, but also for actually game designers, and that's the magic circle, or in Dutch, the tover circle. And that's the idea of Heisinger, that play always takes place in a demarcated space, where actually, um, Play only matters in itself, so it doesn't have a direct function. It may have a function for society, but it's not a direct function. And I would say that since the 19th century, late 19th century, we see that play becomes far more uh, demarcated in that way. So one could say that curated playgrounds are regulated and tend more to be, to be ordered. Um, but in a way, that's already a paradox because, because it is demarcated, it actually opens up a space in which there is freedom. So there is again this, this tension between confinement and freedom. At the same time, if you look, that again, another thing would be to just look at playgrounds in different countries and how they are organized and also what kind of imaginary they use, right? Do they use castles on playgrounds or more abstract stuff, maybe? They are, of course, also curated playgrounds imbued with ideologies, materialized in the design, and they say a lot about what a culture thinks about what is play and what isn't. Can you climb that high, or does that become too risky to be called play, for example? Now, let me all take you back to your childhood for a moment, and the moments you remember when you were playing. For me, coming from a highly organized urban society, uh, uh, I, I, I'm from Amsterdam, it was always the moment that I wasn't on that playground, but somewhere where I wasn't supposed to play. Making fires, you know, a bit of mischief, um, that sort of attracts us, right? And it often also appeals to more than one sense, the fire, the smell, coming back to your mother, and you smell off the smoke. And she said, what did you do? And you say, nothing, I didn't do anything. But anyway, those moments are the most imaginative and visceral because we can really experiment, right? And we make our own playgrounds, you could say. And uh, on this picture, you also see a picture of an illegal rave during the COVID-19 crisis, which were organized especially quite often in the UK, which of course sort of heightened that sort of need, but also enjoyment of that visceral, uh, non-curated, illicit play. Now, there are of course very, very many forms of informal play which are not all, all, always illicit or forbidden, uh, on, the, on the right of this slide, you see a picture of Think Tanger, uh, who do sort of things with play in an urban environment with people as co-creators uh, to understand the neighborhood, but also certain uh, economical change, environmental issues, etc. Uh, parkour, of course, but also uh, uh, 
a post-war playground in the UK where someone really advocated and that also after that the hippie movement did that in, in Europe as well, that actually the more ruined sort of bed playgrounds are the places where you learn most. Now, I come to something which actually drove my thoughts on this research for the last five years, and that is this thing, this picture, but also the text uh, next to it. Something which is fully accepted by game designers and game thinkers and um, game scholars is that there is a moment that play stops. And that's either when you get bored or when you get too anxious. Now, you already see the link I'm making here with COVID-19, a moment of crisis where boredom and anxiety are very, um, yeah, adjacent to the experience, or almost, almost there, right? Imminent, they're imminently there, I, could sh I should say. And that always intrigued me. Is that so? Is play not happening anymore when either you get too excessive, too obsessive, too shocked, too indifferent, too heedless, or too abstract in your mind, maybe, as well? Because there is this very uh, famous uh, uh, behavioral scientist, Cheeks and Mihaly, who wrote together with Bennett, also a behaviorist, that play may stretch over longer or shorter periods of time, but is not character characterized by boredom or anxiety. And I started to wonder, even more so during the COVID crisis, is that so? I started to look at pictures of people in, in prison, for example, but also how soldiers were playing uh, in, uh, while waiting uh, to fight, for example. Um, and is that so that at that moment that you are bored or anxious, that you don't play anymore, and, you, uh, uh, and that you start to play to counter that? Or could you think more complex, yeah, more as the two, as, in, as a continuous process in which they are sort of folded into play, right? So, to conclude what I just said up till now is that there's a tension between freedom of play and curating play and that materiality of play matters. Um, also, I think that's again very important to stress, yes, play may be universal, but play and how it brings freedom is highly personal, complex and situated to speak with Donna Haraway. Now, I have been doing some uh, autoethnographical research um, about, especially about post-colonialism and games. And one of the things I did with Stephanie de Smaler was uh, playing civilization together. And there were loads of moments, and people who play games know that, also with board games, that you don't do nothing, that you don't do anything, that you're just waiting for your turn. And we, in our autoethnography, started to discover of course, as scholars, I should say, that those were the moments that we reflected most on what we were doing. So we wrote about that, uh, of the moments of waiting, of glit glitches, of failure of the game as well, and what happens there. So in that way, I would say you could argue that it's a very important moment in play to reflect on play. So, in times of crisis, as I already said, boredom and fear are always imminently present. You try to keep them out, but they are sort of knocking on the door the whole time, right? And the question then is, if play at such moments of crisis is a tactic to counter boredom or a way to embrace it, uh, uh, embrace boredom and fear and transform them into something else so that it's part of the process still and not out of the magic circle, so to speak. I want to end with uh, one of my favor favorite philosophers who actually also wrote about uh, boredom, uh, Walter Benjamin. Um, just a beautiful uh, quote is, boredom is the dream bird that hatches the egg, the egg of experience. But also he said, without boredom, the gift for listening is lost and the community of listeners disappears. And that this relates to my remark about reflection, when you're silent, when you don't do, you start to think, right? 
So I would argue, but I'm very open to have discussions about that because thoughts are never set in stone, especially not in the humanities, right? That boredom can be, it doesn't have to be, part of playful or even also creative processes. Play gives hope in these situations, I would say. And it's also, and that is also my link I wanted to make with the following speaker, and actually the following speakers. It's a way of worlding, it's a way of making worlds. So in that way, it may be still very much related to freedom, but not in this sort of binary way, I would say. To dig a bit more into how we do play at Leiden University, um, we have a couple of research projects which have play at their core, um, and the, the speakers after me will speak about that. Uh, first, uh, Professor Franz Willem Korster will talk about the project we conduct together with others as well, playing politics, and then uh, Dr. Aris Polyktopoulos and Dr. Angus Moll, Angus Moll will, will do the honor of talking, will talk about the relation between play and past. Thank you. Thanks, Sibyl. And uh, now for uh, something else, politics and how it relates to play. Um, I only have these papers, so it'll be my words that will have to do the trick. <laughs> and perhaps some of you might immediately think, what is the relation between play and politics? Isn't play fun and politics serious? And that might be a fundamental misunderstanding of what play is and what politics is. So play is very serious. Um, and you can imagine that or feel that immediately yourself if you do a play, let's say, tennis, and then someone suddenly takes the ball in his hand or her hand and throws it at you. Then you would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You might even get angry. Because someone simply did something else than what the play should be about. So, Johan Huizinger also said, play is serious. We are immensely focused, intensely focused when we play. The same holds for politics. We are immensely focused. <laughs> this was like playing with the light. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and um, now that we've played with the light, I can also say perhaps we are in a different situation. You might even say this is the beginning of a different world. If we would come to complete darkness, we would be in another world. So if we talk about the connection between play and politics, the fundamental relation between the two is that they make worlds. So politics is about making worlds and play is about making worlds. You immediately have the distinction, for instance, if you play, between the world of play and the world of non-play. Likewise, if you get into politics, you have the world of politics and the world of non-politics. So we have a multiplicity of worlds. So this is why you can immediately say, if people say, we live in one world, you simply can say, no, we live in a multiplicity of worlds. Many, many worlds. And if we play, there's an opening up of worlds. And if we go into politics, there's an opening up of worlds. By the way, if you open up worlds, you also close down worlds. There's splits in the road which is the fundament of politics. Now, when we engage in this project called Playing Politics and, and try to think through what it means in the contemporary situation where we have digital media and social media, we also encountered that we had to rethink what these concepts mean, play and politics. And here we made a very sharp distinction between politics and power, which is something that a lot of people mix up. Power involves other forms of play than politics might even be nasty plays. Most of the time these are nasty plays if people start to use power. So if we talk about politics, the question is, what do we mean with politics and how does it relate to play? And here we thought through that politics comes to life as a concept in the context of the city. That's where the, the very term politics comes from, polis. The Latin term would be kivitas, not the nation state, the city. Now, what characterizes a city? It characterizes people who live together with very different interests. 
people never agree. If they agree, you should ask, what's happening here? If they are forced to agree, you should ask, who is the power, what is the power that forces people to agree? We are very different people. And in a city we come together to live together with our differences. Now the question is, how are we allowed, how are we capable to live together with all these differences? This is where politics comes to life, as the means to negotiate the differences and not be split in conflicting parties. So this is why politics is about moderation. Those politicians who seek conflict are no politicians, they are power people. Politics is about moderation, trying to find the ways in which we can live together. So this is where it becomes interesting. If we define politics as that institute, that force that brings people together with their differences, how could we think about that? One of the most important texts, I think, in history about, let's say, this form of politics, and keep in mind, you can have your own de definition of politics, but this is ours, right? was Marcellus of Padua, then we're in the 14th century. Who is the enemy of politics at the time, according to Marcellus of Padua? The Roman Catholic Church. This is why he was defined as the worst heretic ever by the Pope. Why is Roman Catholic Church against politics? Because, Marcellus says, it's an oikos, it's a house. And it's from that one house that the public realm of differences of people with their different interests is ruled where all people have to somehow agree that they are one in this house. And then Marcellus says, we are not one. And then he gives the metaphor of an animal. So the city is an animal, it's a horse. A horse with different parts. All these parts want to do something. They're doing different things. What should politics be? The organization, the moderation, the combination of these different things. He calls that the head of the horse. And he calls that the defender of the peace. That's politics. All these different interests, people in tension, possibly in conflict, avoid the conflict, please. Let's try to live together with all our differences. So that's our kind of pivotal take on politics, which means that we then have to distinguish between two forces of difference. We have the play of difference, which is the play of all these different parts in the city, all these people with the different interests, they're working. It's a, it's a play. And we have the play with difference, which is politics. How can politicians use this? How can they avoid conflict? How can they play with it? Which also means that politicians, if you, if you want politicians to speak the truth, actually you're asking rather stupid thing. They can't speak the truth because then they can, can, can't combine the forces anymore. So sometimes they have to say to this entity, yes, I agree. And meanwhile, they give money to that entity. They might say things like, I want to do away with migration. Meanwhile, facilitating opening up the borders. What politicians say and what they do, if they're proper politicians, is in the service of avoiding conflict. That's our analysis. So. Um, if this then is a different, difficult play, also a skillful play, this comes to light mostly if we get to moments of crisis. That's when we're going to see what's going to happen. How are politicians skillful in playing with all the tensions, all the conflicts? This is also where splits in the road may occur, where we suddenly choose for one world, not another. If we, for instance, opt in the European context for opening up the borders, that opens up a different world. So we think about play and politics in the connection of making worlds by thinking about politics, not as politicians who project a world and then start to work towards it, but as that unpredictable coincidence of forces, which is essentially the freedom of politics. So this is the connection with what Johan Huizinga says. We choose to play. And if we choose to be politicians, we accept the differences with which we live and the unpredictable outcome of this. Tomorrow we might have another world. All those who want the world to stay the same 
are not politicians. They are power figures. They want to preserve what is. They don't open up to the forces of difference. That's our reading of things. Now, what happens if in this complex force field there's new digital media and new social media? We have an enormous force and actually pretty young as well. How long do we have this? Less than a generation almost. And it's changed the world. It has changed worlds. Now that must affect politics. But does it affect politics in a principal sense? In the sense that we should rethink what politics is nowadays? Or is politics by and large the same and uses it, these, these technologies differently? That's the question behind our project. We think we might have to rethink what politics is. Because technologies change things, they change worlds, they change people. We are no longer the same people with these damn things. As a fascinating documentary made in the Netherlands, when they, where they asked people when this came onto the market whether they would want the mobile phone. Unanimously, they said, are you mad? I already have a phone. By the way, I can be reached everywhere. I don't want that. Three years later, they all had it. And their world had changed. And their modes of thinking had changed. So that's what we're studying. If we now see the potential in this new technology, do we see new forms of politics? Or do we need to see new politicians? And are they politicians in the sense that we thought about politicians? Or are they using this new technology to use their power? So the building block of the project is that one of us is looking at how politicians use memes. So previously, politicians used to be the object of cartoons. Now they make them themselves. That's the difference. Another one is looking at, usually, politicians were representatives when they were in parliament to represent the interests of their people. Nowadays, we have politicians who don't care about being in parliament because they use the parliament to do another game with the constituency outside of the parliament. One of us is looking at the situation in Turkey. Sanya Inse on the first row, so you can ask her. How in Turkey are social media used in relation to politics? One of us is looking at, with the current media, are we still talking about moderation, or are these new media geared towards conflict? I'm looking at how people use the law to play with the law, which is a very dangerous thing to do. And then in the end, there will be a wrap-up of Sibyl and Alex Gecker, who will talk about the new situation in terms of how platforms are used, how the making of worlds might have to be redefined. That's it. So we're at the start of this project, and if it's real research, we don't know yet where we're going to end. That's where we are. Within three years, we will know, and I'd be happy to come back to uh, report on the results. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Franz Willem, for this uh, theoretical expose and the start of a project. Um, at the same time, of course, there is also the, the practice of play. And just to test the waters a little bit here, uh, if I say Minecraft, uh, is that a term that is familiar to whom here? So could I see some, some hands? Minecraft. Who has ever played Minecraft or seen somebody playing it? Okay, so there is definitely some, some um, there's some recognizability around, around the room for that. Because what I want to talk about very briefly here, and I will actually play it as well right here, is Minecraft. And particularly how Minecraft, this enormously popular game, allows us access to other worlds, access quite literally to the past, and to also create other pasts through it. So if you've never heard of Minecraft, uh, these are just some quick stats. It's an enormously uh, popular game. Uh, currently, there are 141 million people around the world actively playing Minecraft each year. If we would add up all the time that people have been mi playing Minecraft collectively, we would be able to reach all the way back 160 million, 8 million years. So we would be in the time of the dinosaurs. What we've uh, been doing um, with Minecraft, as people who are interested, as people who are into heritage studies, as people who are professionally interested in the past, is leverage this enormously popular power of this playful medium to 
explore the past together in a project called, this is a wonderful bit of wordplay in Dutch, because it's called Romeincraft, which is Roman and Minecraft, Romein and Minecraft, um, as, a, as an outreach project. So what we did, we uh, created, recreated, together with a lot of different uh, participants, most of them obviously being kids or people at least with a, uh, a playful attitude, uh, we recreated what is called the Roman Limes, so the Roman northern border of the empire. We are here, obviously, in a long time ago, the southern border of the empire in the Netherlands, so the Roman border area. We did this in 14 different uh, galleries, libraries, uh, ateliers and museums in the provinces of South Holland, Gelderland and Limburg, basically across the south of the Netherlands, and we had more than 2,000 people visiting our events, and we had 500 builders being part of that. Uh, this is what this looked like in practice. This is at the National Museum of Antiquities in the Netherlands, quite literally surrounded by the past here, this beautiful uh, temple, uh, which was a gift from uh, the Egyptian government to the Netherlands. Um, and we were here <laughs> with our computers and a bunch of participants plunked down, quite literally among this ancient temple, playing and reconstructing uh, the past. Now, you could, of course, be mistaken for understanding play as something that is not serious, right? Because we're often told that play is not serious. You cannot do serious scholarship while playing. That's absolutely not the case. And this playing actually required, oh, this is a good thing to also say, we didn't only allow people to reconstruct things, but using virtual reality headsets, people could actually walk around in those things that they had been building together. It doesn't only require uh, playing and a playful mode of behavior, but it also requires a lot of knowledge, actually, to be able to transmit in a playful mode like Minecraft what you wanted to get across in terms of understanding, in this case, the Roman past. So we based ourselves on archaeological and historical knowledge of this Roman border area in the Netherlands. This is where a couple of maps of that. And we used that Roman, uh, that, that Roman archaeological knowledge uh, to create a map at a one to fourth scale of the province of South Holland in Minecraft with a little program called World Painter, which allows you to quite literally paint worlds that you will then walk around in in Minecraft. And we also, in some cases, gave a bit of handholds for people in terms of the buildings that they could start to make in that world as well. Um, I could do this with still images, but I actually would uh, want to check out if I'm going to do a bit of a live demo, always dangerous when you're doing stuff like this. But let's just visit this world together right now. Let's visit this past that was created by upwards of 500 participants uh, together. So welcome in the Roman Netherlands in Minecraft 150 AD. Uh, as you can see, um, I'm currently a little bit stuck in this particular Roman watchtower um, that was built here along uh, what is called the Limes Road, so the Roman border road. And uh, this is in creative mode, by the way, so if you're wondering why I can fly, well, people in Minecraft can fly if they want to. Um, and as you can see, this was a road that sort of stretched across the whole area in this very, back then when the Netherlands was still a very heavily forested and swampy area. And we're just going to really quickly, I uh, won't, I could do this for hours and hours and hours and maybe play a little bit with you, build a couple of things, but we have to be you know, we have to hold ourselves in a little bit. We're just going uh, to just travel across this, this Limes Road. And here you see the very first building that was built by the very first participant of our events, another Roman watchtower. Um, these Roman watchtowers in the, in the past would have been spaced about 500 meters separate from each other. So you can imagine an enormous amount of construction across the entirety of the Roman border area in the north. Uh, because, of course, they have to guard against the dangerous barbarians, which is the people living just across the river, uh, the, 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 the Germanic tribes. And, of course, another way that they did this is not just by watchtowers, but by big Roman forts. In this case, this is the Roman fort of Matilo. Matilo is actually right next to Leiden. It's actually, you could see it as the birthplace of Leiden, the, where we are from, Leiden University. Um, but actually, it, and it's a, it's a heritage monument, it's a national monument, but it's completely beneath the soil. It has never been excavated. We know it is there. Parts of it have been excavated, but the big fort is not there. So we have to use our imagination if we want to understand what it actually was like there. And that's literally what we did. We sat together with a lot of different kids from Leiden and, and, uh, and uh, around, um, and we rebuild what we think, based on best archaeological knowledge, could be that particular border area. At the same time, when you're playing, right, 
you can curate everything very heavily, as Sibyl was already talking about. But there's also a freedom to it. And we also wanted to allow that in our project. We wanted to allow people to imagine what these Roman pasts would be like. So, for example, there was one participant who said the commander's headquarters, which in archaeological understanding would be something like this. That's not a commander's headquarters. It needs to be more of a mansion. So that's what, the, what they built. There was somebody who was interested in making a more of a Dutch-style kennel house, so that's what they built. And there were obviously people that were very interested, because we don't know that they were there, but in building more uh, classical-style uh, Greek temples. We quite know for sure that they weren't there, but that's what they built. And that's for us. Even this is not a factual past, as archaeologists would understand it, gives us a very good understanding of what people are actually, in fact, imagining the past to be. And those are the moments when you can start discussing with each other what shaped the past took, in my opinion, in my understanding of it, but also in the understanding of other people. And at the same time, it can also lead to really interesting um, uh, explorations of it and new understandings of it. Because one of the things that one of our participants did, they built another watchtower, but they said, well, wouldn't these Romans have been terribly scared, right, to sit there in a watchtower and be so visible? So what they did, they built this treehouse watchtower, which um, um, it basically allows you to both hide and observe. Well, obviously, I'm going to guess that there were no actual Roman treehouse watchtowers. We don't know for sure, obviously, but we haven't excavated them, let's put it like that. Um, but this, this does give you a new understanding as an archaeologist, as somebody interested in the Roman past, of actually a sort of experience that these Roman soldiers could have had, right? Being both observant and maybe also trying to hide a little bit when those Germanic tribes would be knocking on their door. And at the same time, we also had people, and this is what I'll end us with, I also always think that this is a charming thing, that there were people who just tried to break the Roman past as we had it. So there were people that were very happy to uh, build in a bunch of polar bears as well. I'm currently being charged by one, as you see. So that's also part of it. And this person that put this in there perfect, knew perfectly well that there weren't any polar bears in Roman, Dutch, Dutch Roman camps. But it's part of this conversation that you can have through play about the shape of the past. And we're going to be continuing that conversation with uh, Aris Politopoulos. Uh, thank you. a bit shorter. Dear Dean of the faculty, colleagues, students, thank you very much for having us here on this beautiful day, on this magnificent room, really. I am amazed by, by the beauty of this particular uh, lecture hall, I must admit. Um, I, uh, I will keep this short. I would like to present you another uh, project that we've been doing at Leiden University. Uh, it's called the Past at Play Lab which is a project that we've been running, um, Professor Sibi Lames, uh, Angus, and myself for the last two years, together with two uh, amazing students that we have from Leiden University, Lotte de Groot and Leneke de Lanke. Um, and this project sort of brings in together a lot of the things that had already been presented today. Um, this idea that culture arises in and as play, right? the fact that play and politics can uh, be intertwined in some ways, and the fact that, that play provides an access to experience the past. So all these three ideas are actually in this Past at Play Lab project. Um, basically, our idea and our premise was, well, if culture does arise in play, and people always played, then we surely should be look, looking archaeologically at the things that people played with, right? Play should give us a glimpse of the experience of the lives of past people, because we, we do know that people played in the past. Um, but archaeology alone does not suffice, because we don't have the people here to actually tell us, and the materials can only tell us so much. And this is coming actually from an archaeologist. Um, so we thought that we should bring um, oh, there, as I said earlier, play and games, right? A tale as old as time. We know games, well, from Africa, right? Uh, like Mancala. We know from uh, Central America, like the Mesoamerican ball game, Senate from Egypt, the Royal Game of Food, of which I'm going to talk to you about. And of course, the Olympic Games from Greece that we still have with us today. Um, 
So, for this project, we decided to bring different methods together. Archaeology, to talk about the material culture, about the ways, about the materials with which people played in the past. Um, digital humanities, to create the data sets and the digital data sets um, that were required for this kind of study and media and heritage studies to actually analyze this kind of data sets and actually see how people played. So, how did this project look like? Because theory is good and all, but how did it look like in practice? It looked something like this. Our idea was that we wanted to give people the opportunity to play with objects from the past, to play with games from the past. So, we researched ancient board games, and in particular, the Royal Game of Ur, I will show it to you in a moment, right? We said, okay, do you want to see how people played in the past? Come and play these ancient board games. We had them there in our spaces, but during COVID-19, we actually had to have disinfected uh, lab sessions, but when things opened up, we could actually travel ar uh, around and go to cafes, go to museums, go to universities, and have students and friends and colleagues and people on the street, just quite literally everyone, who wanted to try out their hands and see how did it feel to play an ancient board game, try it out and actually play this board game. We were monitoring this very closely. So these sessions, as you can see, were recorded by an overhead camera. Uh, all the conversations were recorded. People were asked to fill in a survey afterwards. So we have collected um, a, a holistic data set, one can say, um, that we are currently in the process of analyzing. Um, so today I would like to give you this small glimpse in the past and talk to you about the game that we actually played, give you some information about this, um, and maybe we can uh, uh, in the future talk about such games here in Morocco as well. So the game that we played is called the Royal Game of Ur. It's this board right here. This is actually not the real one, it's a replica, because the real one is in the British Museum and they wouldn't let me keep the real one. So we do have a replica, and we have another replica over there that was made by a carpenter, in fact. The game is called the Royal Game of Ur because it was found in, uh, in the cemetery of the ancient Mesopotamian city called Ur. It was excavated by Sir Leonard Woolley back in 1926. Um, and in one of his journals, there is actually an entry where he talks about this board. And he says, the board lay face upwards in the soil with the decay of the wood and the whole of the encrustation of the upper surface had sunk down into the void. So left, while the strip work along the sides remains sticking up above it. In fact, in this cemetery, we had six of these kind of boards, uh, six games of Ur, um, but only one of them remained in such a good conditions, condition with all the pieces and the proper set of dice as well. Um, you can see Leonard Woolley in the middle actually holding, holding a nice uh, lyre that was excavated from that cemetery. So the cemetery dates back to 2600 to 2350 before Christ. So that's, that's pretty old, in fact. Uh, and it is uh, the case that the first attestations of this game happened somewhere in the third millennium BC in Mesopotamia and in southern Iran. You can see over here also the location of the city of Ur and various other cities in which the game has been found, and also here in southern Iran. The game didn't stop being played, however, in the 3rd millennium BC. It actually continued for a very long time, and it spread across um, the vast ge geographical region, spreading from Iran all the way to southern Egypt, to the Levantine region, to Cyprus, and to southern Turkey as well. So people played this game more or less everywhere in what we would call the Near East and Egypt, and for more or less about 3,000 years. So it must have been quite a fun game to play. <clears throat> and it is a game, the, the name might deceive you because we call it the Royal Game of Ur, so one might rightfully think that it is a game for kings indeed, but we know for a fact that this is not the case. Uh, versions of, the, of this game, which 
can otherwise be called as the game of 20 squares because it has 20 squares on it, has been found in Egypt in various nice travel forms. This is actually a real travel kit for ancient Egyptians because on one side it has the game of the 20 squares and on the other side it has a game of Senate and it has this little nice drawer that you can see where you can store your pieces and your astragals that you use as dice and you can take it with you if you're a trader and go to Cyprus and still be able to play your fun game. Another very nice version of the game, actually one of my favorites as an archaeologist who likes all things that are a bit like trash, the, the, the garbage of people, so to say, uh, is a graffito version of the game. Now this, what you see here, is a Lamassu. These are these giant statues that were in the uh, capitals of ancient Assyria. And on the basis of one of these statues, some probably bored guards that had to guard this thing until it actually moved to its place um, had scratched the game and played while waiting for the boat to come and pick this thing up. And they could do this because it would actually be installed and then nobody would be able to see it. And the reason that we are able to see it is because it was eventually removed and transported, a truly colonial action, by the British uh, to the British Museum. And you can see this game over here. Now, let's call it the game of 20 squares to not create any misunderstandings. And this game has been found in burial contexts, right, in cemeteries, in houses, in this kind of statues that I've shown you. Um, and it was actually commonly played with astragals, right, uh, knuckle ships, uh, knuckles of ships, or with casting sticks. We have some on the table if you would like to come and have a look at how it might have, how uh, the game might have looked at the time. Now we call it the game of 20 squares because we don't really know what was the name of the game in antiquity. We don't know how they called it in Mesopotamia. We have this idea that it might have been called Erbe Eta, Room 4, which sometimes we find it in cuneiform tablets, or sometimes we see it in Egyptian paintings with the name Iseb or Aseb associated with it. But it's unclear. We don't really know. And we also know that the board that I've shown you right here, which is the board of the third millennium BC, is actually uh, actually changed over time. And throughout the second and first millennium BC, the game changed and it took this shape, which retained the number of squares, the 20 squares, right? Um, but the rules changed slightly. And if you're interested, we're going to have the boards right here and we can tell you how the game was played and, and, and have a go at it. Now, how, how do we know how this game was played? Well, um, we were lucky enough that um, the curator of the British Museum, Dr. Irving Finkel, at some point was going through the archives of the British Museum and found this tablet. Now, this tablet dates to 177 BC, so considerably later from when the game was actually began being played. Um, and this tablet actually does not contain the rules of the game. But what it does contain is it contains betting rules. People were actually betting real money on this game. So you can imagine ancient Babylonians sitting there, right? Some two people were playing and some other were placing bets on the rolls and on which square its, um, its piece would land and then they could get a lot of money or more likely they would probably lose a lot of money. Um, based on this tablet, then Irving Fingel managed to decipher the rules of the game and these are the rules that we are using in our experiments uh, where people come in our lab uh, and play the game. Um, these are the basic rules of the game and of course you should expect that by 177 BC everybody more or less would have known the game, they didn't need to be told the rules, but we do. And thankfully now we actually know these rules and we were able to run um, these experiments even in COVID times. We had more than 200 games played uh, in our experiments, so we have a lot of data to go through. Um, and we would really like to have the opportunity to do this here in Morocco as well, not only with games from the East, but also African games and games, ancient games from Morocco, because we do know that there were plenty, uh, and it's a, a field of study that 
has a lot of value in it. There's a lot of Moroccan heritage in it. And it's something that's very much worth being studied. So with that, I will close. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if we would have time for questions, but hopefully you enjoyed these presentations. And thank you once again for having us here. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, for your presentations. As uh, the last speaker, Aris Politopoulos, said, uh, all speakers are uh, inviting you to ask questions, if you have any, or maybe you want to start playing, I don't know. Are there any questions on behalf of the audience? Maybe you're all tired and you want to go out and play, as uh, Professor Lamas uh, was already suggesting. Uh, so, if there are no more questions, yes, Professor, Professor Mahmoud. Yeah. Ah, the mic is coming. Yeah, I think that certainly there is a lot of play in politics. There has always been, but there, ha there have been some new, I mean, change, like there are, I mean, the digital revolution has brought about some new phenomena in politics. And one of them, of course, is like online platforms, social media, where a lot of this politics is taking place. And of course, uh, um, yeah, you talked about one class of politicians, yeah, decision makers, you know, those people who tell one group of people something but do something with another group. But there is also this, I mean, other part of politics, which is social movements, yeah. So these movements that, I mean, try also to resist, okay, or try, of course, they have their own stakes, they try to make changes in their own societies and so on. And a lot of this is taking place also on social media and social platforms and using digital technologies and so on. And in literature on social movement, I think today uh, there is a bit of questioning of really the power because initially there was a lot of euphoria. There was a lot of this, for, I mean, talk about like, for example, Facebook, you know, being like the enabler of a lot of youth revolutions around the world. But now, you know, with the advantage of time, we are seeing that sometimes maybe what these social media do is that take the, they take the politics away from the street into, social, into virtual worlds and so on. I was just wondering if, you, is as part of the project, you are also looking into these dynamics of power and the resistance. Yes, it works. That's a great question, thanks. Uh, actually, there's, there's still someone else as well uh, involved who's looking at young people using these platforms to mobilize themselves and to be active politically. So time and again, I think we're looking at what are the affordances offered by these new uh, media and how do the different actors use them? It's not just politicians, it's in this case also young people who on the face of it, do not participate in politics because they don't go to vote, for instance, but they are politically active through these platforms. These are new forms of political engagement, for sure, related to this new technology. So there's a lot to be done, uh, and that, like I said, this is such a new phenomenon that we are kind of still trying to find out where to go, but it's important that we do it uh, because we think that this will not go away and we won't go back to the old forms of politics. So we better rapidly start to understand what's going on in order to be able to analyze it and to work with it. Yes, well put, Franz Willem. Uh, also to add to that, we, we also look a lot at cases to understand that better. Also to add to what you said, maybe we should move away from the term electorate and it's better to talk about constituency to understand new politics. But for example, we're now writing a piece uh, as a team about the, the, the situation in the United States with the 6th of January, uh, you know, the storming of the Capitol, which is often uh, uh, compared with a game. And we try to understand what happened there. And that, in a way, you could say that was also involving 
a social movement, maybe not how we think, again, traditionally about social uh, movements, and platforms and platformization was very important in how that was orchestrated, how it was also made into a conspiracy theory by some afterwards. So through this case-based approach, which we'll do, we'll do with more of those social movements and moments of controversy and high media attention, we try to answer, hopefully, partly what you were uh, pointing out. First, uh, I'm sorry for my English. It's not good. Uh, I want to. Uh, I have a uh, question. Is about uh, these video games. Uh, I respect our culture, uh, our uh, our mentality, our uh, uh, our goals, and our life, our children. Uh, 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 play in, in our society is, uh, is different about your society and our uh, different society. Uh, play for Moroccan children is not about uh, have a fun, is uh, have a, uh, experience, uh, person, uh, personality, good personality, have a different idea, have a different uh, life. Uh, play have different definition of me in other uh, in others, we can change change the video games of the, the, the idea idea of video games of uh, other for all for all for uh, for not uh, take uh, one idea for all uh, of all the world. Uh, may, uh, maybe uh, have uh, have my my phone. Uh, a game is his name uh, Dream League. It's about football, but we we all we know we uh, we all love uh, football, but we do, uh, we don't respect our culture. Our culture is about uh, play uh, uh, It's a traditional play. Uh, this uh, this uh, my question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for the for sharing those insights. So this is one of the reasons why we're here because we obviously understand that we play within the Netherlands, within what you could say Western Europe, within a particular framework where fun is very much central. Um, and I'm very happy to hear that there's another mode of another focus on playing in other places in the world. And uh, you can still say that play is important, but that there's different focus, foci in it. I think that there are certain games that are really good at working with different ways of understanding play. For example, you can play Minecraft and you can have, I don't know what exactly those words were that you just used. I will need maybe Leon to translate that for me right now or otherwise later. Um, that you can have experiences that are uh, meaningful in other ways, right? So, uh, and but that's already that's already in the Netherlands. When we were making, when we were doing these events, there were kids there. Most of the time, there were kids that were very serious about reconstructing those old Roman houses, and there were kids there that would just wanted to, you know, put in a bunch of polar bears. So even within cultures, I'm sure that there's still a lot of diversity in that, and understanding that. And working with that is, I think, also at the core of what the humanities in general is about. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the rich uh, presentation. Uh, really, I'm so glad, uh, especially when I heard about the expose about uh, games the relationship between games and history. I know, you know I'm, that I'm archaeologue, so it's really my specialty. So it's really very important to have such games like this in our country. Why? Because a lot of persons in my country did not recognize, did not know about their history. I will give some, uh, sadly, what we are studying in school, in history in school, I'm speaking about primary school, 
They are more studying about Second World War, about Stalin, about Hitler, about some, some, some civilization, Moroccan civilization, different Moroccan civilization, different dynasty that govern in Morocco. But maybe they don't know really the components, the historical components, the archaeological components of their cities. Maybe if you ask someone living in Saleh or in Rabat, you ask him about the gates, you ask him about the, the historical building that exists in the, his Medina, maybe he will not know that. So maybe games like this can, will be able to find, to give the students the opportunity to know, to learn about their patrimony, and also maybe it's very important to appropriate this patrimony, to feel that this patrimony is, 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 is mine, it, is theirs, it's, it's, it's yours. And this is very important because in this way, surely, maybe they will, much, will be much, much better proud of their patrimony, of their historical heritage. Surely they will do as possible as they can the maximum to protect this, this patrimony. Surely maybe they will, uh, they will uh, uh, teach, uh, try to transmit it to the future generation as it was transmitted to us by uh, our grandfather. And maybe this can help mostly of, uh, of people, as I said, to keep the authenticity that we find in our Medina. So really, uh, I hope, inshallah, my friends promised me this yesterday, inshallah, or before yesterday, I hope, inshallah, that maybe they will create a game like this for Morocco, for Saleh. It will be an honor for us to have a, a big project about the game in Saleh, or in Rabat, in the, in the old Medina, maybe to show, to show this, to the youngest, as I said, their history. It was very, also a very, very good experience. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Shukran Zaf, Barakalafikum. Yeah. Um, brief, uh, just a brief uh, to, to say how, how much I agree with, with your point. And this is also partly our idea behind the, the Rome Minecraft project is that we get people closer with the heritage of their own cities, of places that they might otherwise not know and have the opportunity to engage with it creatively and, and in their own terms. And, and I must admit that when you were giving us the tour um, and we're standing there in front of the gate and we're hearing about the ship going through the gate, um, we actually were talking about how awesome would that look in Minecraft. Uh, so inshallah we will have the opportunity to actually do such events here and um, exchange knowledge and exchange experiences uh, and we can then learn from you uh, a lot about the history of these cities. Thank you. Maybe if I may add something to that, I think it would be a beautiful project to see whether there are students here in the room who, who are willing to work on that together with students coming from the Netherlands. Actually, our students now are about to leave, but I think it would be wonderful if some of you here would go with our students on a tour to Saleh with, uh, with Dr. Crombie. That would really be very, very good. And then start working together with Angus and, and Aris uh, on such a project. I'm convinced that Leiden University and uh, Niemar, that they can bring together some funds in order to start such an experiment. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that we have already found an alley in Saleh. Let's see whether there are also Ribatiyin who want to join us. If not, it will be just uh, Slawis. Yak. Tabarakalalek. Tfadli Lala. Bonsoir. Uh, I, I, je m'excuse uh, for my bad <laughs> English because we, we, uh, I hadn't uh, habited uh, to talk uh, in, uh, in this uh, language. Uh, but I have uh, one question. We are very cu curious to know what the old player of the words and collected them and uh, uh, le, le, uh, exposes, exposes them in one museum of world and make comparison w with our players. And uh, if, uh, if, w w w if uh, we, uh, de uh, we make that, we uh, uh, retrouve 
our uh, one civilization, um, uh, qui nous rassemble. Uh, and thank you. I would say it's an anthropological, it's an archaeological question, Aris. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, there is no escape, Aris. <laughs> no, but I, I must say that this indeed is is an important point that, and with with our project, this is one indeed of the ideas that we can get a glimpse of of how people played in the in the past, and maybe it would it is completely different than the way that we play. Today, in the same way that we were talking about it before, that there is difference in how people play in different cultures, but in the end, all people play. And it might be for different reasons, or there might be different priorities, or different understandings, but we all play. Um, and in that sense, within museum settings, or within schools, or within universities, we can get this play and really bring this, yeah, bring these ancient people to life by us taking these movements and doing these activities, this activity of play, really playfully engage with, uh, with our shared histories in the end. Yeah, and, and as a brief addition to that, play is something that often doesn't, it, it, it doesn't have a, a natural place in our universities or academies, but obviously it has a natural place in its life and in the life of cultures as uh, Professor Lummer so nicely talked about in the beginning about imaginings, about worldings, and therefore I think it is also, uh, I'm very happy that there's so many people here that stayed to listen to us talk, um, because we really need to do this together, because obviously we have one piece of the, of the play puzzle, and there's other many other pieces of the play puzzle that really need to come together, because we, the last thing we would want to do is take away from the diversity of play. Uh, in, in its sort of, in a monolithic understanding. So absolutely, a world museum of play or a world playground would be a wonderful idea, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, before I give the floor to Professor Mortagi, that we might take it all as an invitation by our dear colleagues to take play more seriously, uh, or even if that sounds as a contradiction, as a contradiction in terminis, uh, but to to study what we know about play. Huh? Morocco is proud to have the oldest uh, remains of Homo sapiens. Morocco is proud to have the oldest jewelry. Well, let's see what Morocco ca can present to the world in terms of world heritage uh, in bringing, making, let's say, a kind of encyclopedia or uh, of of games and and place eh? there was when we visited uh, Linsap, the institute for archaeology and heritage uh, on tuesday morning uh, one of the colleagues uh, mentioned all these small holes in the rock engravings and whether these are traces of play but it could start very early on eh? as you already mentioned in your question Morocco has a lot of specific plays and, and games, so it would be nice if you would start to collect that, and we, we hope to have a, a meeting, maybe next year, inshallah, on uh, play and game studies, so you're all very wel welcome to contribute to, to the inventory, so to speak. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the Professor Mortagi would like to ask a question, and where? Okay, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Uh, hello everyone, uh, thank you for your intriguing presentation. I actually did not know that people investigated play academically and scientifically. So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, play as a job. Uh, so many people are looking at uh, games and play in general as a profession. So do you also investigate this? And uh, the second question concerns the psychological effects that play uh, made on people? Thank you for your questions. I don't know if it's a disadvantage of, or a disadvantage that we humanity scholars and not psychologists. We surely work with psychologists in certain uh, projects. Regarding play and labor, you could say, Yes, the people who play in the game industry, and as we understood, that's also a burgeoning uh, uh, 
thing here, uh, which Morocco is very interested in, in becoming stronger and bigger in, and not just following the West in what game should be, right? Uh, that's also a very important thing, that uh, they are, there are games which are produced and designed in this cultural context, I think. But it's also on a different level, and that, as humanities scholars, we do engage with. I mean, I, I was talking about boredom and anxiety, anxiety, but often if you play, especially on those platforms, you also do work for other people, right? Even if it's only your data which are used by other people. And sometimes, um, when you do certain games, like Candy Crush, for example, it almost feels like it's a chore you're doing. So on many different levels, you could make a relation between uh, play and, get, uh, and, and work, which is often called, on that level of what you do when you play, it's often called play ber as a term. Yeah. And Perhaps me. to add one thing about your second question. We are not psychologists, but we are very much interested in the force of representation and the force of technologies. And if people think they use mobile phones, it's the other way around. Yeah. People are mobile phonalized, which means that they are different people. Yeah. And if I'm, uh, I may add, add one point on the, on the jobs and play, there is also quite a, within play scholars, there is a bit of a debate on what does it mean to play and whether somebody who is, let's say, a professional football player, does she still play football or is it, is it just that person's job? Uh, or a poker player, or, or, or an esports player, or a, or a basketball player. Is this simply their job, or, or are they engaging in play? And depending on the kind of scholars that you read, there are different understandings of whether this play cannot be a, a job, play needs to be voluntarily housing, I would argue, then other scholars would argue that it, this is not necessarily the case. Play can be forced, or play can be also a form of labor. So in that sense, there is, within the philosophical debate about, of, about play, there is quite a bit of discussion. And if that's something that's interesting for you, of course, we can also help you out in the kind of things that uh, you could read. And we are all workers in play, right? Also as academics. <laughs> yeah. And a, a, a small minor comment, obviously we're not psychologists, but play has a, a major impact. If, Play studies are very central in psychology and how games in particular affect us, of course, is a big, the violence part of that is a big question. One of the things that I had the pleasure of running a, a course called uh, Games and Stories of COVID-19, in which we played games together with our students and students played themselves and they had auto-ethnographic diaries of the play that they've been doing during that time. And I think what struck out to us was how diverse play, uh, um, how diverse a role play has in terms of well-being. So certain students, this was within the game studies minor, were so happy that they could be at home, locked away at home, playing online with their friends all day. Other people were the most miserable they have been every day, uh, have been ever since, right? And all the different things in terms of psychological well-being and how play affects us, are obviously things, questions for psychologists, but within the diversity and the rich and deep complex experiences of play, there are also very much humanities questions, I think, as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this great, great presentation that opened our mind uh, for a lot of new subjects and the relationship between the humanity and the new media. Uh, and we are uh, PhD student need to be open of this type of studies because it changed our view uh, of the new university lesson and also coronavirus gave us a lesson in the importance of the technology uh, in all area of life, studies, work and uh, wherever. How, how do you see the situation after this virus uh, with the regard of the new media and the future. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, that would take a couple of days and weeks and years to, uh, to answer. I think the most important thing for now is, um, so people often adjust to new technologies by linking it to former technologies. So if I say I pick up the phone, I do something like this. That's, that's not the phone anymore. So that's one aspect. The other one is that people often don't realize what the new technology is already doing without uh, realizing it. 
And I think that's for the humanities one of the major tasks, to, to be faster in helping us to feel, sense what it's doing. So perhaps the task of the humanities is less to be critical and more to help people sense what's going on. And that's not just the mobile phone, that's what the mobile phone is doing to the world, how it's related, for instance, to the conflict in East Congo, right? So the war in East Congo is in my pocket. What does that mean, politically speaking? How am I sensitive to that? Or how am I made insensitive to that? So I think these kinds of questions are important for the future. And if, if I may add uh, an example to this that I think we, we all share is that during COVID-19 we had a lot of online education, right? Whether we liked it or not, we had a lot of online education. And there is a real question what is the value of online education? And now that we are in theory past COVID-19, we don't know in practice yet, but in theory, uh, do we keep elements of online education? Is it, is it worthwhile? Is it worthless? And we, need, we really need to reflect on this process. And projects like playing uh, and politics as well can reflect on such processes. So I would also invite you to, to reflect on your own education and the kind of things that were you learning more, were you learning less, what aspects of online education were valuable and what were not valuable. Discuss this with your teachers and the same goes for the lecturers. We have to reflect, was it more work, was it good work, uh, what kind of things did we need to adjust, do we need to adjust back. There is, it's, a, it's a continuous process of reflection in that way. Um, I, I, sorry, yeah, I don't want to di to disabuse the hospitality of our host too much, so I suggest this is the penultimate question, and then Professor Mortagi, and then we close the session. Eh? So, and but please go ahead. Thank you. And my question is very simple. Um, I would I'd like to first thank you for your very thought-provoking uh, presentation, and I would like to ask you about the Minecraft world. It was rather very interesting, and um, I, want, I wanted to ask, how can we access the world, if it's possible, and why not um, be able, as uh, students in the faculty uh, in Rabat, to collaborate and create other worlds? For instance, create Rabat or Saleh or other cities where we can have monuments, and, uh, and it would be very uh, fun as a collaboration. I think it would be a very fun collaboration as well. So. Absolutely, that's something we would be very interested in, in working on. Um, you can actually explore these worlds yourself. They are uh, on our website, which uh, is in Dutch. Uh, well, bits of it are in English, in fact, so you should be able to um, find your way there to download the world.save, so the, the, save, the save world. It's romaincraft.nl uh, as the name of the project, uh, so romaincraft.nl, and we can maybe give you the direct uh, address later. Um, absolutely, so one of the things that, uh, as you will probably, I'm gonna guess you've played online before. Uh, as you will know, online places can also be quite unruly. And one of the things that, in our terms of our events and our, our reconstructions, what we don't necessarily want is to have things happen that are not fun, that are can be uh, you know, hurtful or whatever. So often when we run these events, we run them simply offline. We have a local server that we bring, and that server we use to access with our PCs, th that runs the world, and all the PCs that are currently within that network can play. During COVID-19, we've actually set up an online server for uh, bored archaeology students at the Faculty of Archaeology, where they uh, we just made the, the entirety of the world on, at scale, and they built all sorts of heritage uh, buildings in the world uh, from that, which was a lovely project. Took a lot of work for us to moderate, to, to make sure even with otherwise very nice archaeology students, still there was some moderation needed. So this is the big, in terms of online collaborations, moderation, making sure that those things that happen there are actually positive, um, um, reinforcing the values that we can collectively talk about and hold dear, uh, is of course an important thing, but we'd be absolutely happy to run an online server with you if you want to set that up. apt that uh, Professor Mortaj is going to ask the last question. Did, did you get the microphone or? Yeah, it's coming to you, uh, she said.
Thank you for your brilliant presentations. Uh, I have just a brief que question related to uh, immaterial cultural heritage. Uh, I wonder uh, if you did work on uh, plays that, that don't uh, involve material uh, games in your corpus if you did uh, on mater immaterial culture, uh, cultural heritage. Yeah, this is a <laughs> this is a very good point. Actually, it's one of the whether the play is material or immaterial is a, uh, is quite a it's not a debate. Play can be immaterial. You can just play in a park, and this is of course something that's very hard to attest to in in, in the archaeological horizon because simply it just vanishes. Um, but we've been thinking a lot and talking a lot, and actually we have a paper in, in preparation where we're also talking about this component, the fact that play can happen in spaces where it doesn't leave a trace, but we can think about the space as a playground. So a city can be also a, play, a place where people play in, and maybe we can't find pieces in the board, but there might be other traces of play that we need to, that we should be looking for. And in that sense, that's something that archaeologists haven't done. They're not looking at archaeological sites as playgrounds. And this is what we are proposing. We should be looking at places where people lived, also as places where people played. And then we can start recognizing this immaterial play that could take place in, this, uh, in these cities, in these archaeological sites, villages, uh, whatever is the site. So it's a work in process, but hopefully uh, we will have more on this soon. Yeah, and from, from a less old perspective, um, in another project I did before this, I also worked with a smell mapper, and we walked on, on the island of Malta, uh, also in a cultural heritage rich environment. And we tried, and that's also what we've been working on uh, recently, to think about the multisensorial in how you experience uh, the past or urban environments with past things instilled in them. So we worked with this a smell artist and through smelling uh, environments you get also a new experience of uh, the layers of a city and the past of a city. So there are ways and that also ties into our work with playful methods in our research in which you can also uh, broaden or, or deepening, I would say, uh, the experience of the past. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. First of all, to Professor Jamal Adin El Hani, who has uh, offered us hospitality. We have been very serious, we have been playful, but we have been working for three hours, so I think it's a big su success. That shows what cooperation with Dutch is. It, it's all of, uh, you think it's play, but it becomes hard work. But thank you to, to uh, Professor Lamas and Professor Korsten and to Aris Politopoulos and Angus Moll for your uh, expose for your uh, uh, presentations and thank you to all of you for your interests, very rich questions and we hope that to use another quote this will be the beginning or the re-beginning of a beautiful friendship after uh, COVID inshallah. So thank you very much all of you.